requesting everyone to kindly put your phone on silent or on flight mode. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I extend a warm welcome to you all to this seminal event we have convened this afternoon. Without further ado, let's commence and proceedings. Before I invite the dignitaries onto the desk, we take pleasure in screening the official video on India's momentous G20 presidency. May I request the video may be played. India, home to 1.3 billion people, is a confluence of religions, traditions, and customs. A thriving global center of technology and the world's largest democracy. As one of the oldest civilizations in the world with a rich cultural heritage and diversity. And as the fifth largest economy in the world, India is proud to assume the presidency of G20. As the country blooms into a new era, we look to another poignant symbol for humanity to emerge victorious from challenges. The Lotus, the national flower of India, represents our history and culture and symbolizes spirituality, fruitfulness, wealth, and knowledge. And that's the inspiration for India's G20 global design. The design rendered in saffron, white, green, and blue is drawn from the national flag of India. The seven petals in the logo signify the seven seas and the coming together of seven continents at G20 India 2023. Sitting above the lotus is a representation of the earth, reflecting India's pro-planet approach to life and seeing the world as one family. From this, we derive the theme for G20 India 2023. Vasubhairva, Kutumbakam, One Earth, One Family, One Future. A theme that brings the G20's focus on shared global growth. While being in harmony, with nature. G20 India 2023. One earth, one family, one future. Thank you. May I now request the dignitaries on the days, Professor Aprajita Gangopadhyay, Dean of School of International and Area Studies, may kindly usher our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Harilal Menon, the key note speaker, Professor Arvind Kumar, and Dr. Priya Darshi Dash onto the stage. Thank you, ma'am. As is often customary, we kickstart all noble things with the auspiciousness of lightning of the traditional lamp. May I request the Honorable Vice Chancellor to lead dignitaries on the days in the doing the honor.
Thank you. I take this opportunity to invite Professor Aprajita Gangapati Sayas to welcome the guest and to deliver her introduction. Ma'am, please. Good afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to welcome the dignitaries on the stage, Professor Harilal B. Menon, the ninth Vice Chancellor of Goa University, Professor Arvind Kumar from the American Studies Program of the Center for Canadian, U.S. and Latin American Studies from the School of International Studies at JNU or Jawaharlal University, New Delhi, Dr. Priyadarshi Das, who, who also represents, along with uh, Professor Arvind Kumar, the RIS today, on behalf of the Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, Dr. Datesh Parulekar, Assistant Professor at the School of International and Area Studies, uh, who represents the Goa University today at the lecture. Uh, he's also a speaker. Also, I welcome uh, the registrar, probably he's on his way, Professor Nathkarni, the various deans that are present today, uh, the various vice deans that are there of the various schools of Goa University, members of the G20 committee for today's event, officers of the university, winners of various competitions that were organized in the last two weeks, students, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. We take great pride in the fact that Goa University is hosting the event today. It is one of the 75 universities around the country that has been chosen to participate in the University Connect um, uh, that is organized by the Government of India. This is a very prestigious uh, event and which for which we are participating today. Uh, a little bit about G20 and then I'm, I'll speak a little bit about the kind of activities we are going to be doing in the next uh, year, uh, September, October of 2023. And then I'll introduce the speakers by a few lines. Uh, this, this is present for everybody here. So it's, it, it gives you a detail of the program. Uh, it's part of the G20 efforts at India's presidency that began on the 1st of December 2022. Uh, all of you know we, the government of India had a huge uh, program of University Connect, and many of us actually joined and participated in the program, even if it was uh, not physically present, but from here. Uh, the inaugural function of the, Goa University, of the University Connect at Goa University has been part of the various programs that have been conducted as academic and extension activities throughout our university. Uh, as we uh, know, the G20 essentially focuses largely on broad macroeconomic issues, but over time, the scope, the mandate of the G20 has expanded to include things like trade, climate change, sustainable development, health, agriculture, environment, and anti-corruption. The logo forwarded, which is we all can see the logo forwarded by India in 2022 is Kutumbukam, One Earth, One Family, One Future. It has been drawn from the ancient Sanskrit text of Maha Upanishad. It essentially reaffirms the value of life, the interconnectedness of Earth and the wider universe. The theme that India spotlights in the G20 is life, life for all environment and is associated with sustainable and responsible choices, both at the individual level as well as the national development, leading to a globally transformative actions for cleaner, greener, and bluer future. It conveys a powerful message of the G20 uh, presidency. It strives at just equitable growth for whole world in a sustainable, holistic, responsible, and inclusive manner. For India, it also marks the beginning of the Amrit Kal, leading to centenary celebrations of India's independence. This, this year from the, or let's put it from the 1st of December last year to say October of 2023, we will be holding a whole series of activities for G20. A number of them have already been held and you know, uh, for example, we in the last two weeks we've had competitions, which is poster making on G20, elocutions on G20, um, quiz on G20 and also uh, the essay writing uh, on, on G20. Uh, the coming year will also see a number of other activities 
For example, there will be a young G20 Young Scholars Conference where we expect that uh, scholars from the different schools will participate and, and, uh, and present a research paper on different aspects of G20. We are also planning to hold a G20 Model Leaders Summit which I was told that is maybe will be held during the Platonica, but nevertheless, but we are planning to do that as well. Uh, the G20 activities are also pla are planned for the colleges as well of the Goa University, uh, the 64 odd colleges that are associated with us in terms of the uh, day long activities of through workshops, seminars and conferences and other activities uh, in the various colleges. We are also planning to organize three national seminars uh, in the month of, of July, August and September or maybe when the monsoons go a little better, maybe July lay end, August end and October, September lay end. And these will be on different aspects of G20. The Vice Chancellor has been very kind and has given us the uh, permission to hold these. And so we should hold them in these three months and hoping that they will, there'll be a one day conferences. So it will be hopefully that bring out different aspects of G20. And it'll, hopefully it will be successful and India's presidency should be seen and understood by everybody as part of this G20 endeavor that India is doing. Uh, now let me not take more time. Uh, I would just say a few lines about the main speakers today. Today we have three speakers with us, Professor Arvind Kumar, uh, Dr. Priyadarshi Das and uh, Dr. Datesh Parulekar. Uh, professor Arvind Kumar is a professor of American uh, from the School of International Studies, Jawala Nehru University, uh, New Delhi. His research interests include strategic capabilities of China and Pakistan, nuclear doctrines and strategy, nuclear weapons and delivery systems, India's internal security issues, Indo-US relations, and defense strategy and planning. He was uh, at the National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore and at the, National, uh, at the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis at New Delhi. Uh, he is a member, uh, he has a number of uh, publications to his credit in journals and co of contemporary uh, India program and he's also advisory committee member of the, uh, of the uh, contemporary India studies program at the University of Warsaw in, in Poland. Uh, he's a member of the Institute, uh, International Studies Association as well as the European International Studies Association in India. Uh, the second uh, person that I'm going to speak about is Dr. Das. Dr. Priyadarshi Das is an associate professor at uh, at Research and Information System uh, at the RIS, which is our co-host for this function today uh, of the MEA in New Delhi, India. He contributes to RIS work programs on G20, BIMSTEC, Indo-Pacific, and India-Africa Growth Corridor. His research uh, interests and development strategies, he works on research, his research interests uh, include uh, services, trade, regional financial cooperation, infrastructure, ma macroeconomics and development strategies and the blue economy. He is also widely published and several papers in peer-reviewed journals and edited volumes. He has visited Korea Institute for Industrial Economics and Trade in Seoul as a visiting fellow and holds a PhD in economics from IIT Bombay and received an award for excellence on thesis work from IIT Bombay. The last but not the least speaker is of course Dr. Datesh Parulekar from the School of International and Area Studies, Goa University. He's an assistant professor and the program director of the School of International Area Studies. Uh, he is a visiting faculty at the Rashtri Raksha uh, University, Gandhinagar, Gujarat, a an institution of national Im uh, importance of the government of India. His specializations, the areas of specialization are India's foreign policy, Chinese foreign political economy, strategic maritime affairs, and Eurasian and West Asian geopolitics. He period periodically lectures on myriad strategic issues at all national defense institutions. Uh, we are very closely associated with the National uh, war, uh, the Naval War College at Verum because many of you have visited that as well and uh, uh, Goa and uh, at the uh, College of Defense Management and College of Air Warfare at Secunderabad. Uh, he's also associated with multiple think tanks, public universities and institutes of China, besides across Europe, Latin America and uh, South Asia. Besides being a regular strategic commentator, he's involved with uh, research projects, uh, which are with the Kajima Institute of Peace in Japan and the Institute of Security and Development Policy in Sweden. Thank you so much. And uh, may I ask my colleague, Dr. Mukut? Yes.
Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now I request our Vice Chancellor uh, to kindly offer a bouquet to our keynote speaker, Professor Arvind Kumar. And to Dr. Dash. Thank you, sir. May I now request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Harilal Menon, to address us through his presidential remark, sir. <clears throat> Professor Arvind Kumar, <clears throat> JNU, uh, Dr. Priyadarshi Dash, uh, Professor of RIS, Dean, SIAS, Goa University, other colleagues on DAS, all my other colleagues who assembled here, and uh, my dear uh, students. G20, I'm not from this knowledge domain, but gathered, let me try to communicate with you. G20 is 19 countries and Europe, basically to discuss, to discuss the uh, various aspects of economics across the world so that decision can be made, decision can be, uh, you know, brought out, safety of the entire world. But when you say India getting the presidency, this is the first time that we are getting. And there are some, you know, specific uh, aspect of India should be, uh, you know, told here. One is that India is in the fifth as far as the economy is concerned. And of course, India is the second most populous country in the world. Therefore, we should, in fact, India's releasing the, uh, you know, the CD, that uh, our main motto is Vasudeva Kudumbagam. Therefore, we have to see that this is a platform where we can you know, showcase our vision so that a peace would prevail across the whole world. Now, the uh, priorities, what I understood are, one is that sustainable development. Second one is the uh, climate change. The third is technology and the fourth one is uh, governance. When I say the sustainable development, if you look at India, we have progressed a lot in the sense that the, uh, poverty has been reduced a lot. And again, if you look at that, you know, it's only through education this can be done. Therefore, there's a large access for the people to get education. And if you look at NEP, there's a large stress in our gross enrollment ratio has to be high to 50, particularly for those in the 23rd to, you know, 30 year old. That is one. And second thing is that India is committed to meet all the UN SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, by 2030. And if you look at the climate change, India has already taken so many initiatives to reduce the emission, greenhouse gases. And let me tell you that it's not only the greenhouse gas, rather when the, when the present government has taken over, if you remember that there was an appeal to surrender the gas connection if you have more than one. That is basically, in North India, people are using firewood for cooking. And what happens is that when you do the, I mean, when you use firewood, it adds a lot of black carbon, soot particles to the atmosphere. And the basic property of these particles are that it absorbs the solar radiation. You know the solar radiation, especially those who, do, who are from the science know that it's a visible part of electromagnetic spectrum that is responsible for our climate. So if that gets absorbed by this particle, we may not even get monsoon. So therefore, that particle's emission also should be reduced. So government has already taken initiative. India has already taken initiative in, this, in that direction. And then we know that, you know, for the last uh, six decades, if you see, six to seven decades, if you see that, there is always cyclone in the Bay of Bengal. Not, it was not in the Arabian Sea, barring five years. Five years because that means Arabians also getting warmed up. 
So now if you see that, because of the initiative by the government, probably this will be reduced, especially the warming of Arabian Sea can comparatively be reduced. And moreover, India becoming president of this, probably they would be able to impress upon the neighboring country to reduce gas emission or the greenhouse gas emissions. So that way India is taking a large lead in this direction. And then when you say technology, in fact, India is the capital of, or the hub of startups. India, I mean, most of the trades are, you know, online, you know, transfer, et cetera. And if India succeeds in doing the online transfer across the world, especially the transaction across the world, many of the, uh, you know, the, the present day, what we face, like terrorism, et cetera, can comparatively be reduced. So that's uh, about technology. And then when you say the global go governance, we say Vasudeva Kudumbangam, because though we have, you know, the um, two neighboring countries always want to fight with us because of our approach, you know, things are not going out of our way. And moreover, we have seen that how the government is taking an initiative to stop that Ukraine war. So therefore, in all India is certainly doing, I mean, these are their uh, and in that respect, let's say that all these things would further uh, strengthen and probably we will have a peace across the world and let India be in the forefront for that. I think to speak this, we have three experts sitting over here. So probably once you listen to them, I will also understand many, many thank you for, uh, first of all, inviting me. In fact, I was not here. I came only in the morning and therefore it has been reached today. And thank you, uh, Professor Abrajida for that and let you have a fruitful discussion in the uh, coming two hours. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Your perceptive remark have set the tone for the proceedings ahead. May I now invite Professor Arvind Kumar Professor of American Studies at the Center for Canadian, U.S. and Latin American Studies at the School of International Studies, JNU, to deliver the keynote address. So. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Harilal Menon, the Dean of uh, School of International Area Studies, Professor Apajita Gangopadhyay, other esteemed members of this uh, discussion meeting, students, ladies and gentlemen. Let me at the outset uh, thank uh, University, RIS, and more particularly International Area Studies for organizing this lecture, because this is very important in the current context. Our Honorable Vice Chancellor, that how India's presidency is going in the world and that perhaps is one of the important uh, dimension in the current context which obviously will also see that India whether India really becomes a country which can assume the responsibility to lead the global affairs I think a lot of these things are being debated and the members of international community in particular they are eyeing on India that how how India can become a part of the solution to the global problem so there are a number of problems which again was identified by Honorable uh, Vice Chancellor. What I will do that I will give you a geopolitical context in the beginning to tell you that how G20 came into existence because that is something very important for you as a, a student of international relations or a research scholar doing PhD program because to know. While the Second World War was still continuing, the members of allied powers, they became very much worried that what is going to be the nature of global economy after the world war gets ended. And in that context, the US took the lead and they called the other members, uh, allied powers, and sat at Bretton's Wood. And in Bretton's Wood, they deliberated and really have had a lot of these concerns raised by all the members that how best they could really address in terms of restructuring the global economy. And in that context, they came up with two international financial institutions. One was the International Monetary Fund, and second was the World Bank. Technically speaking, these two institutions came into existence in the year 1946, and they were, they were assigned certain mandates. And these mandates were largely to see that how best 
there could be an emphasis on international economic cooperation. That something could not really continue for a longer period. What happened that International Monetary Fund kept supporting the cause of the European countries and the World Bank, kept, in fact, kept supporting the cause of the United States. There was nothing left for developing countries. As you know that after the World War II got over, a number of new nations had emerged in both Asia and Africa, and these nations became politically independent, but economically, they were very much dependent on those countries which were so-called industrialized countries. And they were obviously trying to lead the world. They were trying to portray that they really have the solution for all the global concerns, especially on the economic sphere. And in that way, what happened, that developing countries, obviously, were kept completely in isolation. India really had shown assertiveness at that given point in time in terms of coming out and obviously seeing that how best India could really be able to bring certain pertinent, important areas which were certainly be seen as a part of the challenge for the global peace and stability. So the leadership of India obviously was not that factor at that given point in time in terms of becoming more assertive, which is now we are seeing having a greater transition in the nature of India is something which we have to really consider. The decade of 50s, decade of 60s, obviously didn't see much change in the nature of the global economy. There was an uneven growth in the overall GDP of the global economy. And obviously, as you know, India had adopted the closed economy. India really was not a part of the mainstream of the global economy. And that really, I will just try to really correlate that at a later part of my lecture. And in that aspect of the whole changes which were occurring, especially from the global point of view, India again was not anywhere on the radar screen of global economy. The decade of 70s saw, again, the slowing down of global economy, more particularly those economies which were trying to tell the world that they can lead the overall development, they can obviously resolve the global economic problem. They were slowing down. So what happened? Again, these countries, I, I call them a very, I don't know, these countries, again, having certain self-interest, they really came together in the form of G6, which became G7 when Canada was uh, incorporated in the year 1976. These G6 were largely the so-called industrialized nations. Only one country from Asian continent was part of G6. It was Japan. No other countries, obviously, were on the horizon of showing the sign of consistency in terms of their economic growth. So G7 came into existence with the incorporation of Canada in 1976. That really made the whole world completely different because these G7, again, started talking about how best they can cooperate, how best they can have certain economic advantages from their policies. And obviously, on the other side, the so-called developed and developing world debate started, and developing world came up with the idea of G77 platform. G77, again, India was taking the lead, largely in the context of tailing these G7 countries that is high time that now the, the, the overall economic growth should be sustainable and it should not be at the cost of the developing world. By the way, many of you sitting here, obviously, may be using the word developed countries and developing countries, and the definition basically is very simple. But whenever I have addressed to the group of scholars and the students and asked them what is a developed country and what is a developing country, I have got varied answers, obviously, of a different nature. But let me tell you for your, in fact, a sim understanding in a simpler way, a developed country is one whose per capita energy consumption is high. That speaks everything about your infrastructure, your education, your health, everything comes. A developing country is one whose per capita energy consumption is low. So India again, suppose we are having now three trillion economy, we are still are in the, that bracket of developing world. China has 15 trillion economy, but they still are in the bracket of developing countries because their per capita energy consumption is still low. And that is something which is very important to understand, the larger debate which really shaped the nature of economic system in this whole world. So G7 debate again was taking a shape, G77 again was moving ahead, and in the larger context of the Asian economy, China liberalized its economy in the year 1978. They obviously, they were waiting for Mao to die. Mao died in 1976, and they really transitioned from the closed economy to open market economy in the, in the year 1978 with Deng Xiaoping really took over, he took over. So China slowly and steadily started showing the sign of consistency in terms of their economic growth. 
by the time India <coughs> saw the pressure coming from the rest of the world, that India has to become a part of mainstream, India cannot really be seen in isolation. India also took that stand. As you know that in 1991, the remarkable change which India really showed to the world was in the process of how best it could really liberalize and obviously really see a part of the open market economy. India did that. So the decade of 90s was very significant for India because by the time the 90s, the decade of 90s got over, India's consistency in terms of its economic growth was seen rising. And that consistency was obviously seen to be emerging a number of countries in the decade of 90s, the so-called, the concept of emerging economies. And in that emerging economies, India, India, China, and many other countries, like in, uh, in North Asia, you had uh, South Korea, which is which was coming. In the whole of Southeast Asia, you had Indonesia coming as one of the rising economy. And then again, the, the, some of these countries in Latin America, the countries such as Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, these countries, again, we are showing the sign of consistency in terms of the economic growth. The whole of African continent, again, saw a consistency in terms of the GDP of South Africa uh, among the 52 nations in Africa. South Africa was showing the positive sign of the economic growth. And that, again, these countries, again, we are being seen by the members of G7 with certain, uh, deg uh, certain degree of uh, uh, this thing that how best they could really bring them in a manner by which there could be a semblance of their understanding between the needs of developing world and the developed world. So the decade of 90s had seen a grave crisis in Asian economy, the so-called Asian financial crisis. This crisis was limited to the country Asia. Singapore in particular was getting the maximum impact. It was obviously uh, 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 getting the maximum impact, but the other part of Asian continent obviously Limited impact on this Asian in the year 1999 this G7 became G20 technically speaking they brought all those countries which we are showing the sign of emerging economies a consistency in terms of their economic growth all this really happened and the G7 became G20 all those countries which I took the name a couple of minutes ago they became part of G20 and in that context India obviously was seen to be a part of global solution, especially solution to the global problem. Since then, 1999, the track which they had kept in the beginning about G20 was to see that how best they, there could be a yearly meeting among finance ministers of G20 countries. G20 consists of the 19 nations, as I told you, G7. Then you have had Mexico, then South Africa. The South Asian nations, you have only India. Then again, in the North Asia, you have only uh, this uh, South Korea as a member. And again, the other part, part country which really became a part of this was Russia, because Russia was treated very badly by G7. But that uh, moment was so limited in terms of making G7 to G8, not really sustained for long period because they had annexed Crimea in 2014. Russia again was ousted from that committee of nations, which always thought that they are the most privileged lot in the world. Particularly, largely we are coming from the European uh, Union. One such was Italy, Germany and France, these three countries. Perspective which was again seen that how best European Union can be given a membership in G20. Do you see European Union consists of 28 countries? Plus, as you see, that already G7 had Italy, France, and Germany. So these three, so again, if you see this configuration, you have 19 plus 25. These many countries technically are part of this G20. G20 is not only 20 nations. This 19 plus, out of that 28, I have just decreased three because of this Italy, Germany, and France, 25. was given was international economic cooperation. The second mandate, which was again very important, and by then as the had been picking up, as you know, the, no one was in fact understanding about the challenges which might emanate from environment, and which can lead to the 
concerns which we are confronting now in the form of climate change. The, the thing which our Honorable Vice Chancellor highlighted, the theme on sustainable development, it was just picking up. After that famous Rio summit in 1992, the concept that yes, there could be more challenges coming if the nation states are not careful. He rightly pointed out that more and more concentration of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, more and more challenges for climate change. And that perhaps speaks about sustainable development because sustainable development is something where you can't just keep developing at the cost of the other areas. And how best, as you know, there's a direct correlation between economic growth and your energy requirement. Because more and more you grow, more and more energy is required. And in that context, the, the very nexus which was by the decade of, by the end of the 90s, and the understanding which was really coming up post Rio summit with regard to the emerging debates on sustainable development. By the time the decade got over, as you know, the the uh, United Nations really had come up with certain very framework that the nation states should work together by which you could really find solution to the emerging problem from these issues of more and more concentration of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, more and more challenges for climate change. And I don't want to go into the details of the larger framework which was created in the form of having these debates as a platform. It was called United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC. And as you know, 1995, the Conference of Parties meeting started happening. India was a very active member. In 1997, the Kyoto Protocol came. India again was a very active member. But those of them which really pollute more. What I mean to say here that the overall pattern, that, that the consumption pattern of the United States, where they kept, they kept emitting carbon more. And more and more emission of carbon in the atmosphere more and more challenges for the larger framework of the climate and climatic variations. So in that context, what happened that India obviously was showing the sign of a lot of this responsibility, that how best they could really uh, be a part of such debate. India took active lead role in many of these deliberations, which happens in the Conference of Parties meeting. And more importantly, if you take Kyoto Protocol as a case in point, again, if you take Copenhagen, which really came in 2009, and Paris Protocol, I think something which I want to highlight here in this audience, the Paris Protocol, for the first time, India really reflected that it has the leadership quality by which it could set the agenda for the world. And India did set the agenda in 2015. And for the first time, China and India sat together and worked together to find out the details of the Paris Protocol. And one such thing which again is going to be used in September meeting, which is going to be a culmination of the leadership summit of all these efforts which India has been making in the G20 deliberations is, is going to be again showcased. And that is that one of the stipulations made in the Paris Protocol that how best the nation states could reduce its dependency on the use of the fossil fuel. And you know, it's good news that the timeline which was given to reduce the dependency on the use of the fossil fuel was 2030. India has shown that result in December 2022 only. It has come down to the level of less than 60% on the use of the fossil fuel, which again, Honorable Vice Chancellor was highlighting that how India basically has been seen as an example by the rest of the world on many of these issues, which again are becoming more and more visible in terms of seeing that how India takes the leadership role and how that leadership role can obviously help India to really assume the larger responsibilities for the world system. And that is something which India has reflected now. So I think that is going to be used by India as a case study to say that how best the rest of the members of the G20, as you know, in the current context, China is the largest emitter of greenhouse gas. The second largest is the United States. The third largest combined is European Union and fourth is India. So India is going to use that. If India can reduce the dependency on the use of fossil fuel, less than 60%, eight years before the deadline, and in next eight years, as you know now, India is no more worried about this sustainable development goals because the target was 2030. Now India is thinking about 20, 2030 and beyond. What India could do? As you know, this sustainable development goals came in 2015. And most of these issues, which were again part of these uh, SDGs, now already taken so seriously by India, where India has to be emulated that how, that how that can be, in fact, taken as an example, that how India has really been moving ahead largely in the context of seeing that its dependency on the use of fossil fuel completely gets decreased. 
because perhaps that is what is the real problem. And all the nations across the globe, they now feel strongly that there, there, is, a, there is a greater need to really reduce the dependency. And that will happen, obviously. And obviously, India is going to use this as a part of a case study to really convince the other members which really are, uh, are becoming uh, uh, a part of the problem. Why I'm saying part of the problem? Because they still have not been showing the sign of reducing the dependency on the, fuel, on the use of the fossil fuel. Because the US has everything in plenty. If you take United States as a case study in terms of their population and their consumption pattern, you'll be surprised to note that they really remain the largest emitter in the world. And they really are not taking the maximum responsibility in terms of addressing to the needs of developing world. As you may recall that when President Trump really had taken over, the first thing he did that he, he, was, he withdrew from the Paris Protocol, and which was again seen to be a larger part of the challenge. The US never became part of the Kyoto Protocol, despite the fact that they were uh, the proponents of various issues in the, in the, in the stipulations made in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Kyoto Protocol. So what I mean to say here that, is that a lot of challenges which again are foreseen by these members now they are obviously thinking that how best India can come up with a certain definite solution to these many problems. So it's a great role for India. India basically is on the cusp of power. And that perhaps India doesn't want to be seen as the most powerful country in the world. India wants to be seen as the most responsible country in the world. And that is something which is reflected when India really talks about the slogan, one earth, one family, or one future. That speaks volume about India's cultural heritage because that is something which is very important. India does not want to really get advantages from the zero sum game. India does not want to get benefit at the from the cost at the cost of the other. India wants to create a situation, and that very situation, I think, perhaps India is showing the sign with a lot of this accountability by which that could really help the rest of the world to understand what is it that India wants, especially in the context of bringing peace and stability as well as, as well as providing solution to the major problems. So I think there is a great responsibility uh, on India, on India's soldier, and that is something which is something uh, which India obviously has to carry on through this G20 platform. The third thing which I want to highlight, and again that India is going to be uh, using that uh, as, as, as a major part of its focus in many of these deliberations with the G20 members and create certain consensus is uh, that uh, technological transformation. As you know, India has been talking about digital India. And uh, digital India is, uh, India obviously will become digital India. It takes its own course. It will take its own time. But how best India could really be able to protect and secure its critical infrastructure? Because something which is, which is going to make India more vulnerable. And there are a lot of critical infrastructure such as power grid, banking and finance, nuclear command and control, railway network, anything which you see, which really you, you see the huge of ICT happening. This again something which India is worrying about, that once India becomes digital, what could really be, what vulnerability will be brought to India and how best India could really become invulnerable. So I think in the digital transformation, uh, India is certainly going to be bringing that as a part of its priority, build the consensus and see that how best those countries which really have been putting a lot of their effort in terms of becoming successful in digitizing their overall uh, uh, critical infrastructure, how best India could learn from that experience. And obviously that the best practices which are being followed in terms of this technological transformation, how best that could be shared among all the members of G20. So I think the task would be to mobilize the public opinion among the G20 members in terms of building that consensus and seeing that there is a proper framework of the best practices which can be used by all the members of uh, G20. So that is again going to happen. The fourth thing which again uh, is coming up as a part of India's priority and that is something which all of us, all of us really uh, uh, have been uh, showing concerns about is the disaster, natural disaster. The hope is there could be certain mechanism by which there should be disaster reduction uh, mechanism and that's something which again has to be done on the basis of knowledge sharing. As you know, most of these uh, uh, predictions uh, with regard to natural disaster other than earthquake, the technology exists. But these are limited to limited countries. So how best India could really prevail upon those countries which can obviously, that is why India very specifically has made one working group that is called Disaster Risk Reduction Working Group and that is something which India has to work continuously in terms of seeing that those countries which really have certain distinct edge in terms of having those capabilities, how best they could share with all the members of G20 which again could get the benefit largely in terms of uh, seeing that how best they could address the larger uh, uh, challenges which emanate from the disaster which really keeps happening. 
The fifth thing, which again is very important, which uh, India certainly would emphasize on, because that has a direct linkage with the climate change, is, uh, is uh, more and more advent of green technology. And obviously, this green technology uh, is going to be uh, one area where uh, the U.S. has taken the lead and how best they could really be able to work with other members of G20. So India will bring these uh, issues with uh, certain very uh, specific details that how best there can be enhancement of the intensity of the wind power which India has been generating, the solar energy, uh, the recycling process, which is very important, as you know, the, for the pollution control, and obviously the, the other vertical farming. Because vertical farming India has been showing a lot of focus right now because it does not even require soil and will also reduce water use. So again, vertical farming is becoming a part of debate because many of the countries, again, are working on this area. So that is something which uh, India basically uh, will have to work in terms of uh, mobilizing the public opinion in the favor of uh, these many changes which are occurring uh, at the global level. Uh, the sixth thing which I feel India will mobilize uh, all these members of G20, that how best there could be of uh, the various, uh, as you know, in India basically focuses on multilateralism and democracy. How best India could really be able to mobilize in terms of seeing that the UN, the so-called UN which was established in 1945, is no more relevant in 2023. UNSC, Security Council, how best India, other potential candidate joining uh, UNSC with veto. So all these aspects, again, would be uh, seen as a part of India's focus. One thing which India obviously has been reflecting uh, because of its rich cultural heritage, that is uh, talking about women-led development. Uh, and So India, again, uh, is going to showcase that in terms of seeing that how women-led development, again, is going to be the main. India certainly will the leaders uh, in uh, September of this year. I would like to focus on uh, how, how there could be some sort of, uh, uh, in fact, bridging the differences among the countries and making trade more liberal. That is something which India will do. Trade for and that's something which, again, India has to, as you know, India has just been able to sign FTA with Australia. How best that there could be more and more opportunity of that type, which could really help uh, the nations uh, to work uh, in overall global requirement. Because I understand the larger predicament, especially after this post-pandemic, that how best there could be certain uh, semblance of thinking which could allow them to work together. So that the ninth thing which I see happening, uh, which India has the strength, because India now has reached to a level where it can negotiate countries from a position of a strength. I think that is something. And India is being respected by the other countries. And that is ha that has happened uh, very slowly and steadily. It has happened in the last few years in particular. And that is something which India will show. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, uh, this uh, health security. How best there could be a semblance of thinking because now all the countries, uh, especially the G20 countries, because they, as you know that 80 percent of uh, uh, the GDP of the global economy comes from these uh, G20 members. And again, if you see the overall population of G20, is roughly uh, 60 to 65 percent of population reside in G20 countries. So a lot of these issues, again, are uh, with a greater focus in terms of enlarging the scope of G20, where it again has uh, been attempting to understand the relevance of other growing economies. And uh, you, you see the list, I think, uh, has uh, distributed to all of you one primer and read that what are those countries which are the leadership summit and that is a speaks volume about India's intent that it might really put across some of the countries name which could really become part of G20 at a later date and something which India has that team spirit it has that leadership quality ultimately at the global scale what matters most is the acceptance of the world. India can't be the that is a great player Others have to say that India is a great country. India is a respectable country. And India is something which can obviously, one can bank on. And that is why I, I see that is going to happen. And that is something which India has been attempting to do that. So this exercise in particular, which is organized by uh, the Research and Information System in developing countries, RIS, uh, uh, an outfit of MEA, is largely to connect with the young minds like you, tell you about the G20, 
tell you about what potential India has and obviously see that how best you can take pride in terms of telling that many of the problems which the globe has obviously can, uh, uh, can be addressed by a country like India. So I think all these aspects again are being done. So maybe I will stop it here. Thank you very much for uh, presently listening to me. And obviously if you have any questions, you can ask me. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Kumar, for your incisive talk and rightly uh, getting into the different perspective of geopolitical context as you spoke about the evolution of entire grouping altogether and how, the, how it has reshaped the economic development and particularly after the 90s with the rise of India as an economic power. And as you rightly said, talked about sustainable development and energy security. These are the need of the hours. And therefore, again, with this auspicious uh, momentous time of India G20 presidency, uh, we must believe one thing that the rise of India as a responsible player or responsible power uh, means a lot and therefore with great power comes great responsibility. Thank you once again, sir. I now invite Dr. Datesh Parulekar, Assistant Professor and Program Director at the school to comment his special address. So. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. It's indeed a privilege to be speaking in a very august session with the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dean Kumar, who's been a well-wisher and mentor for many years, and Professor Gangopadhyay, Dr. Dash, etc. Uh, I'll begin by basically harking you back to December 2019. The Honorable External Affairs Minister was in Mumbai, and he was asked an impromptu question. He was asked, how would you define India and India's profile today? That came the answer. India would be best defined as a Southwest power. Now, what is the meaning of Southwest? When we understand both geopolitics and geoeconomics, this becomes a very intriguing word. It effectively puts together two frameworks, the global South, and as Professor Arvind Kumar said, the dominant West. So what was Dr. Jai Shankar saying? He was effectively saying that the India of today is no longer simply a votary of the global south or somebody who takes pride in standing up to the dominant west. We are actually a bridging power that speaks for the global south on the forums of the dominant west. And that is southwest power. So when we are trying to understand India's G20 presidency, and my talk is going to be focused here on the power of ideation. Because I believe what India, and in fact, the Honorable Vice Chancellor spoke about GDP, et cetera. I think India's biggest strength is its civilizational narrative. And that is what makes India's presidency so unique. If you look at all presidencies since 2008 in Washington, DC, all the way up to 2023, which other country which has helmed the G20, barring probably China, right, can really talk of a civilizational narrative? And that is India. So I'm going to talk to you today of the next 15 odd minutes. The power of India's ideation. Action. Look at India. As Security Council membership that ended last year. India talked of Panchasutra in terms of principles of how the first is samvad or dialogue. The second, sayog or Sanskriti. All five very all five have resonance in India's civilizational antecedents. So let's look at each one of them. Samvad. India has always oh. Even in the Ukraine-Russia crisis, where you see a global rupture in the field of Eurasia, it's a global Who is the country that is emphasizing prior dialogue? Prime Minister Modi is one of only probably three leaders interlocute with Zelensky in Kyiv and with Putin in Moscow. 
only other two being Erdogan and probably Xi Jinping. Nobody else can speak to both and have the credence. And Prime Minister Modi continues to do that and continues to emphasize dialogue. Any global issue that seems to be creating ruptures, India doesn't stand for expanding ruptures. India stands for dovetailing those ruptures into consensus. When Prime Minister Modi, President Jokowi, on the 30th of November last year, he said, welcome to the world's oldest democracy, the mother of all democracies. Democracies are not measured by how long you have been a democracy. Democracies are measured in terms of whether you embody and resonate the spirit of democracy. And India has always, in its interaction, in its society, in the complexity, and even internationally, has always resonated deliberation, consensus, dialogue, finding the common path, convergence. This goes back to even Swami Vivekanand. And I'm, I'm referring to this because when I, when, I heard, when I saw Prime Minister Modi push the Saudi Arabians to hold a virtual summit immediately after COVID had struck, everybody who spoke at the virtual summit, every leader, was talking of one-upmanship. And it reminded me essentially of the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago, where Swami Vivekananda had gone. And while everyone was essentially trying to present one-upmanship of how they are better than the other, they have fought things better than the other, what did he say? One-upmanship will not help us build consensus. It will not help us bring governance. What you need is to come together. And while every leader spoke about how he was trying to deal with COVID, Prime Minister Modi had three things to say. First, let's deal with the crisis as it exists now. But right now, let us plan for the next pandemic because you know that a pandemic will strike. We've seen the frequency of pandemics over the last two decades in particular. And we know that the next pandemic may just be around the corner. We don't want to be found out like how we got found out in 2020. And so the focus has to be on equity and access to good health. And that comes not dominant West speaking down to the global South. That comes through engaging the global South with the dominant West. He was the only leader to speak of that. The second, India talks of cooperation. In fact, if you see some of the most recent instances, and I'm going to note five very quickly, India is unique in terms of forging cooperation, where cooperation In 2016, global climate change was a very hot topic debate. The US and China went outside the bounds of, of, of Paris Accords and did their own deal. India did a deal as well, but India did a, did a deal. The International Solar Alliance with France, which was un unveiled in 2016 and then of course launched in 2017, alliance that essentially talks about capturing solar energy across and being able to make solar energy affordable and accessible to communities and localities across the global south. So joining with a pioneer like France, global well-being. That was India. In 2018, as Dr. Arvind Kumar very rightly said, talking about disaster reduction. Most countries in the world talk about disaster reduction, but when disasters strike, not the material is ever available to be seen. Together and co-chaired with the United States, the structure that sees close to 100 countries now who have signed on to this. And it effectively talks of being able to provide infrastructure resilient to these kind of disasters. So building coalitions, that's part of Sayyok. <clears throat> Another important instance <clears throat> is what has happened to multilateralism. Multilateralism is in a crisis today. And the UN's relevance is at the The reason is very simple to see, as Professor Arvind Kumar said. It's really a crisis of relevance because the institutional firmament of the neoliberal order is today crumbling because it's not able to provide solutions for the world. <clears throat> but what is replacing it? Multilateralism is now becoming innovative and reformed. And that's why our mantra, as articulated by our UNPR, right the way through at the back end of our presidency and of our, of our membership of the Security Council, was India stands for innovative and reformed multilateralism. So what is multilateralism today? Multilateralism today is becoming minilateralism. It's becoming trifectas, three countries getting together. It's becoming quadrilateral, four countries getting together. It's becoming plurilaterals, five plus countries getting together. 
and who seems to be the one that seems to be almost in each one of these collectives, as I call them, strategic collectives. Look at the Quad. India is part of the Quad. The Quad is to our east. There's another Quad that is seemingly emerging to our west, which is called the I2U2. India, Israel, UAE, and the US. India figures there as well. You look at trifactas, Japan, United States, and India, which came about in 2017. India was part of it. At the same time, India is also together with Russia and China in what is called as the RIC. India is the common factor there. You look at the Indo-Pacific economic framework. India has to be a part of it. You show me a single multilateral or a minilateral today where India is not a coveted partner. And what is unique? At a time when the world is essentially caught up in this US-China dichotomy, or caught up in this US culture, the one country that is coveted by Western countries is India. So as I said, International Solar Alliance with France, the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure with the, with the US. It's recently when Chancellor Olaf Scholz was in town, what did we agree? Not just on a green developmental partnership, but for the first time, India and Germany are going to unite together to bring sustainable development to third countries, and these are countries in Africa, working alongside France. We work alongside Japan on a number of initiatives, from the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor to the Expanded Partnership for Quality Infrastructure. We work alongside Japan. We also work alongside the United Kingdom on what is called as IRIS, Infrastructure Resilient Island States. Again, a commitment of India towards the small states. Hardly any countries look for them. But India doesn't just speak in ideation. India also speaks to the credibility of its actions. When India hosted the Voice of the South Summit very recently, more than 140 countries effusively and wholeheartedly joined. Why did they join? Because they see that India brings empowerment of marginalized communities, but also brings emancipation. And what does India bring? The India story. The India story is one to be remarkably proud of, particularly over the last Some of it was mentioned both by Professor uh, Arvind Kumar and by the Honorable Vice Chancellor. But it needs to be told. When in revolution, India talks of making the digital revolution as a fundamental public good. We are showing people how it's done. Through Jandhan, financial inclusion was brought about. Through the vaccine process and through the COVID app, we were able to show secure COVID app can be created. And when we launched it and we screened it, more than 140 countries effusively came and said, we would like to learn about it. When we hold bilaterals with different countries of the world, they ask us, please tell us how to instrumentalize financial inclusion, how to take technology down to the masses, because that is what we are doing at every stage. India yeah, shows this through their actions. And that is where cognition also is women-led development. We often forget the gender is, is extremely important. And for long, the West has talked about it, but equity has been elusive. If anything, there is how women have been central to domestic national development in India, to the point where some sophologists and study people have also talked about how the women is a beneficiary sector. So as a result of that, it needs to be told that on either of India's five measures to bring cognition with action. A couple of points that I will make before I stop. The most important factor of India's G20 presidency is going to be able to institute the idea of the Global South in national development processes. And to that extent, bringing the Global South along with the dominant West is going to be India's huge strong suit. India is also going to be leveraging its own stature and its own power to speak for principle. And today, at a time when China and, and India are emerging as two alternative parts, and let's be very honest about it, the Chinese are not just a challenge on the Galwan Valley, the Chinese are an ideational challenge. Because this century essentially is going to be the Chinese century and the Indian century. But where India will stand unique is that you're offering a global alternative that is based on consensus, that is based on convergence, and that is based on strategic cooperation. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Shah, for your insightful perspective and a unique take on India's presidency of the G20, and rightly, and the way the five principles have been talked about. Uh, it is also very important the way you have brought in the different dimensions of minilaterals and multilaterals organization at various levels, regional, sub-regional, as well as global level. Thank you once again, sir. Now I invite Dr. Priyadarshi Dash, Associate Professor at RIS. Sir, kindly deliver your address. Thank you. Uh, first of all, as a co-host, co I would like to extend our sincere thanks to Honorable Vice Chairman, Professor Aparajita for the hard work, and all of you uh, in the university for doing uh, this great um, event. And I think a lot of energy is there in the hall, which has been generated by Professor Arvind Kumar and Dr. Dates. Little above, if I can. You know, G20 uh, perhaps is the most talked about forum now. And the reason being, it represents 80% of the global economy. And it's a sandwich of advanced economies, emerging markets. So whatever you discuss, everything comes to the forum or some way or other. So why not it would be the forum we talk about? So what we gathered so far, G20 has already a quite diversified agenda. It started with a crisis. The process matured over crisis. And perhaps the next level of maturing will, is happening because of another level of crisis that we are facing. So it's a baby born out of crisis. But can we convert it to a platform which can deliver good to the people? The idea of the global citizens, everybody has a fair chance to live in. Everybody has a fair chance to grab the opportunities that we are, uh, say, sort of witnessing. Then only we can say that it's a really a platform that we, we should be. And there is a genuine fear that if you talk everything on G20 platform, the, it will be a crowded agenda without focus. We started with financial stability issues in 99, elevated to leaders level in 2007-8, again because of another financial crisis. And then for some years, there was some framework coming in a very nice way, macroeconomic coordination, not to engage in exchange, exchange rate, manipulating exchange rate, not to manipulate the, the economic weight of the countries in the global governance frameworks, so we sort of brought some discipline that time. But now we are talking about everything, SDG, climate change, energy, poverty, unemployment, everything under the sun we are discussing on G20. So are we getting, say, a crowded agenda which will sort of dilute the glamour that G20 has got so far? The most important question related to this can G20 fill the vacuum in the multilateral process? Both Professor Arvind Kumar and Dr. Dates just now referred. Multilateralism is at crisis. Can G20 fill that vacuum? Or we need to think about G20 plus. Multilateralism is probably at the crisis. I add the word probably to what I said. United Nations, IMF, World Trade Organization, World Health Organization, World Bank, all needs reforms. Because the post-World War architecture was designed that time where the economic configuration was different. Share of developing countries were quite marginal. So naturally, it was the privilege of the G G7 or the advanced economies to dominate the process. So their ideas become the global ideas. So we need to change that. And these institutions, it's more work, which should be sort of more representative in nature and consider the growing economic weight of the emerging markets, like India's share in the global economy has increased. In fact, BRICS, China, 
those who are outside BRICS also, say Nigeria, Turkey, the, the, these are countries which are growing. And then when I say G20 maturing, we, we have now multiple crises. Fuel crisis because of Russia-Ukraine war, food crisis because of, not because of shortage of food, just because of mechanism is not proper. We have food surplus countries, we have food deficient countries. What is lacking to supply the food the way it should reach? There are perishable goods, there, are, uh, there is a need, need for cold storage, there is need for proper warehousing where food could be storage. So there is a distribution problem here. But more than that, food security plus nutrition security is the focus. We just don't need adequate food. We need proper food which is, which is nutritionally sufficient for, for the calorie intake is sufficient for somebody to carry a healthy body and to contribute to raise the human capacity to sustain growth and the quality of a living that we are th thinking about. So, so the emerging crisis what demands now that there is a need for a swift economic recovery and prepare our economies for the future opportunities. We all discussed about the past, the historical evolution of how G20 was originated, what are the challenges were there, what type of power equations are there between the G20 members. But don't just get lost in that logjam. What opportunities are coming and how G20 could grab those opportunities, how G20 could ensure, assure that we really work for development. Now, whether economic issues were dominant or the strategic compulsions make the G20 to sustain, it's not a debate to settle. How much of assurance G20 sort of brings to the common people, that becomes the benchmark. The story is the, the uh, digital financial inclusion, all these uh, things Dr. Dhatya was mentioning, I have in my uh, um, points also. So what are those new opportunities? Digital economy. Digital economy is transforming the way production is happening. 3D printing, artificial intelligence, blockchain, big data. If you do not have competence, you will be again served as a subservient consuming nation buying products from those nations. You need to anticipate these technological changes. Invest now. Invest in R&D now so that you do not lose your export competitiveness in the market. We have a huge youth population, but that is not enough. The youth should be, you should have the skill to compete. And whatever glory we are bringing to India now as a power, as a middle power, will fade unless our human development matches the expectations. So digital economy is a challenge. And a lot of literature are, is, is, uh, is coming on digital divide. Probably time has come that without food, you can survive for a day. But without WhatsApp, without internet, you cannot survive. It's because you are hungry for information. That information empowers you. So we as a young democracy, we as a mother of democracy, should also believe that how, how to harness this digitalization and maintain our age over other economies as a competitive economy, as a power of ideas, power which has a civilization of 5,000 years and more. And along with that digital, we are talking about fourth industrial revolution. Uh, we are talking about financial technology, the abbreviation that we use, FinTech. Can you believe that you can get loan in a fraction of minute in a FinTech app? You can get it. You approach any commercial bank, it will take minimum 15 days, even though you have a good credit score. 20 pages physical form you have to fill. Your guarantor has to declare all the jewelries, land, uh, everything the guarantor has. And you may be denied a loan. I can tell you the app you download, put your numbers there. If you have 40,000 or 50,000, even less than that of your income, you get a loan of 10,000, 50,000, 30,000, depending on your requirement. 
So that has been become possible because of this digital transformation. Any commercial bank will not lend you 20,000. They will lend you minimum one lakh, which you don't need. You need 20,000 to pay for the medical bill. I'm talking about an average citizen who still struggles in the hospital. Can we ensure such kind of financial inclusion? Which is possible. So believe in that, but also bring the regulatory framework so that misuse, manipulation of those platforms doesn't happen. Second, continued demand for investment in quality and resilient infrastructure. Professor Abhin Kumar referred to that, critical infrastructure. Infrastructure on to the next level. It has to be disaster resilient. It has to be compatible to the, to the uh, coastal uh, norms if it is a coastal city. The, the material that the building material that you use, the steel that you choose, the labor that you employ in the infrastructure projects, all has to follow the quality principles of infrastructure, which has been discussed in the G20 platform during Japanese presidency. And the gap of the infrastructure financing demand Financing demand is continuing to grow over time. It means you need more roads, more railway projects for another two, two decades at least, but not the way the, we, we have thought of infrastructure. It has to be multimodal, seamless integration of various modes of transportation. There are cross-border connectivity projects like India, Bangladesh, Myanmar has a trilateral highway, which is not just a road. A part of that is a road, part of that is maritime connectivity. So we have to seamlessly integrate the infrastructure in a way which is quality, resilient, and come at the, at the cost of displacement, and does not come, as, uh, uh, come at the cost of exploiting labor, just because they are available at a low wage, a low wage. So all these things we need to think about. Third one, the new age financial assets, digital money, cryptocurrency, mobile wallets. You never know what type of risks these, these instruments bring. So what I'm trying to tell, G20 finance focus was there in the back. We are again back to the finance agenda, which is dominating G20 business. If you read the press release of the finance minister's meeting, two meetings have already happened during Indian presidency. India is trying to come up with a regulation to regulate cryptocurrency. In fact, our last two union budgets have put heavily punitive tax on the trading in crypto assets. Because we do not know what to do. You do not know by sharing your data, we happily go to malls, buy goods, they ask what is your mobile number, you are by buying grocery, you are giving your mobile number. That becomes a data point for them. That data gets shared across platforms, then you start getting calls. Sir, you have a loan, chahiye, car loan, chahiye, gadi loan, chahiye, aapko, um, um, ye chahiye, wo chahiye. Kaha se aaya wo? Just because you have given your mobile number to somebody somewhere for something. So this, this type of new challenges we need to talk about. So data has become the new source and new oil for the economy. And before we anticipate, advanced countries have already invested huge money and huge resources to work on this. They are now telling what is data privacy. They are now telling what you should be doing for regulating data before we anticipate. So the real danger is we were following the waste 50 years back. We keep following them now, unfortunately. We have success stories, but don't be so complacent what we have done. Much more work is needed to set the agenda, which is not easy. Major powers will not allow middle power countries to so reverse the whole thing. We have to compete still from them that we have a better technology, we have better human power, we are a large nation, we deserve it. That's what indirectly Dr. Dr. Jatish was telling. So, and climate change, uh, marine pollution, all these things, uh, our Honorable VC was referring to monsoon. Uh, sir, ADBI has come up with a, a publication on T20, 
if, if you see the third page of uh, I'm telling to the students, that is, a, that is an engagement group called Think20. The Think20 uh, is like you people, like you, me, we are scholars, university professors, like that. RIS is one of the institutions for India. So they have come up with a publication 10 years of T20, because T20 was established in 2012 during Mexican presidency. What T20 does, T20 discusses issues, T20 writes policy briefs, papers. So we were asked to write a paper, my DG and me, we wrote a paper. There we have put this point, that monsoons have become uncertain, the rainfall, rainfall in certain pockets is inadequate, there is high runoff of uh, rainwater, but still many pockets have, are not getting the adequate rainfall. Global wa warming, coastal pollution, all these are new areas we need to work. And this volume is available on ADBI website. I have a couple of more points. So in essence, every, pres every country has a presidency to come. It has come for uh, this year, it will come, otherwise it could have come some time. So what is so great about it? It's a rotating presidency. You get it 2023, you again get in 2043. Who knows that you may be the Serpa of G20, those who are sitting here, you must be conducting the seminar, what we are doing today. Some of you might have become ministers of digital economy or energy. So somewhere the presidency will come. So what is so great about that? The greatness about Indian presidency at this juncture is we have four consecutive developing country presidency. When advanced economies are struggling, there we have a consecutive developing country presidency. Can we set the agenda for G20? Can we sort of pressurize them to listen to us? He was referring to voice of this global south. You know the, 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 uh, the um, uh, uh, philosophy behind establishment of my institution? Research and Information System for Developing Countries, which we call today, was named Research and Information System for Non-Aligned Countries in 1983. It was a conscious decision of the Global South to establish their own think tank, like OECD for the advanced economies, to warn the developing countries what are the flaws in the GATT agreements, where developing countries are losing. And that's what precisely we did. But when non-aligned movement lost its focus, it is still there as an uh, institution, it was enlarged to developing countries. So Global South is not something that new, but we need to consolidate. It was in a fractured manner. The literature was fra uh, fractured. The global leaders were not confident because you have poverty, you have unemployment. People make fun of you when you speak in global forums. Now, with conviction, we are talking. Prime Minister Modi, with all uh, uh, pride, he speaks because he delivered. The kind of uh, vaccination we did through COVID platform was even not understood by countries, the scale at which it was done. Seamless transfer of 500 uh, rupees during COVID, seamless transfer in, in, in a few minutes to millions of uh, our citizens. It was not possible 20 years back. So the confidence of the southern leaders, not just India, Brazil is speaking like with that language, Africa is catching up. Africa is no longer a poor region only. They have resources. They are catching up. They are saying we also know what to do. So let us not uh, underestimate Africa for the time being. We have written this book, Asia Africa Growth Corridor. I was one of the editors. When we presented this book at the lunch, our African scholars said, don't teach us development. We know what development means. So let us believe that the world is no longer 1945. Multiple powers. And uh, last week, we had a delegation from Korea Institute of Economic Policy. Their founding president was part of the delegation. They had actually come to India, and uh, there was a courtesy visit to RIS. They said, you know, there is a new terminology which is become, which is in air now, is called MPC, middle power countries. He was saying southwest power, but they are saying the middle power countries. So middle power countries have to have a greater role in the global governance. So for consecutive presidency, 
but it's a still hopeful thing. Indonesia is already done. India is four months of presidency is gone. Uh, what would happen in Brazil and South Africa, God only knows. But they are trying to persuade, trying to put pressure that you have to listen to us. And I, I don't know whether you are reading the newspaper, the yoga session, every working group yoga session in the morning. If you see the agenda of the working group, the yoga session and morning walk in the 6 and 7 o'clock, most of the countries are willingly take, taking part. But some countries do not want to be part of the yoga session. Why? They don't want to subscribe to Indian thinking. That why do you do yoga session? It's India's contribution. Yoga day was our contribution. They do not want to just subscribe to, you are a developing country, all these, why would you obey? So some members don't take part in the yoga session. L later on, it was in the news, but it is not made mandatory for them. Those officials who are representing the G20 countries, if they are voluntarily taking part in the yoga session or the morning walk, let them do, otherwise it's not mandatory. But I'm just telling the truth. The global powers would not allow an inch of space where you are acting smart. The more you act smart, they develop the framework to diffuse the, the mobilization ha ha happens among the South. So they want to disturb that mobilization that happens in the global South. And we need to maintain that mobilization. So how to do it? It has to be done through the same set of instruments that they have done, trade, investment, technology, industrialization. Those were the instruments where they have ruled the world. We have to do the same thing. But that requires a lot of work, which we need to do. Uh, just last uh, th three points. So India has given emphasis on digital public good. He has already said women-led development. Just transition, uh, he didn't mention, just transition is something which is like energy transition. We already have made substantial progress in solar energy production, uh, solar energy installed capacity, and also reducing the per unit cost of solar energy production. But also other energies like wind, wave, tidal, a lot of work needs to be done. But at household level, that, that has not happened. I, I, I in fact, asked during Raisina Dialogue, you must have heard of Raisina Dialogue happening last week. I asked this question in that uh, meeting, that we have made good success there. But I don't see my neighbor or anybody constructing a house tells the builder that I don't want conventional energy at my house. Give me solar energy. Make my roof, roof rainwater harvesting structure be there. Nobody is demanding. So household level adoption of renewable energy should also happen. Now who is producing, who is consuming? Whatever. Uh, uh, Solar energy being produced is being consumed by Metro. Metro is a public enterprise. Even though they don't want, the government can say that you have to buy from these companies. But what about you? Have you installed a solar panel at your home? Have you explored that can I do some wind energy? So this has to happen. Household level adoption of renewable energy, it has to happen. But just transition doesn't mean that. Just transition means don't ask us to stop all coal-related production tomorrow itself. Commensurate with the development process, developing countries should get some time to make a swift transition to cleaner forms. You can't just blame when 1960s industrial evolution was happening in the UK, our textile industry was vibrant here in India. Nobody asked that time that whether the environment is getting polluted or not. So when we are now growing, we need more you have to also tolerate a little bit of pollution by us. But we, we don't disagree that there is a need for cleaner energy forms. So there is, needs to be a just and equitable process of transition. Lastly, uh, IMF resources. IMF, uh, unfortunately, despite of so much of campaign by the developing countries, so much of literature against the better new institutions, in fact, my PhD itself is on foreign exchange regional management where I have referred to IMF uh, in a very significant way. We don't have any alternative to IMF. There was an effort by Japan to do Asian Monetary Fund. It was diffused, rejected by the same institutions. There is no alternative to IMF. So what we can do, 
we can keep on pressurizing that you have to reform. You have to acknowledge the new changes that has happened. So for example, voting rights. Everything is linked to voting right. America has high voting right, so everything will be disproportionately higher to them. SDR allocation happened 650 billion SDR were issued to uh, give debt relief to uh, LDCs, 73 LDCs. And how the additional amount of special drawing rights were distributed, those who have high voting share, they will get more. It's like those who are richer, they should become more resources. Those who are poor, they should get less resources. So what, does, what purpose does it serve? See, if you say those who are scoring 90%, they should be given the medal, then what is the purpose of doing the competition? Those who have scored the mark, you just give them the award. In a competition you do means it's open to everybody. So SDR allocation, now they are bothering scratching their head what to do. Because there is a massive rejection of this policy of IMF that it, it is good for nothing. So it has to be redistributed. So they are now working on common uh, debt resolution, all these things. But even though the, 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 the extent of balance of payment crisis or economic crisis the world is facing, IMF resources are itself short. They are doing politics of that, but it is also equally short. It has to raise the resources. SDR reallocation, I am saying, the flawed voting right system is flawed. So uh, uh, emerging market currencies has to be there in the SDR. Now the politics was such that in 2015, in the 15th round of SDR reforms, SDR is a special drawing right where composite, it's a composite currency. US um, dollar, pound, sterling, it's not a medium of exchange, but a store of value for IMF uh, for different uh, member countries. India is not part of that. So all these five, six euro and others are there. They did this politics in 2015 by adding Chinese currency in that. Because who is creating noise in the hall? You are creating the noise. So if I take you into my board, everything is fine. So Chinese currency was added to STR. We kept crying, why not Indian currency? Why not Brazilian real? And we have to cry for some more time. But what China did, the Chinese currency traded in financial markets. Denominated in Chinese currency, they have successfully increased the volume and the intensity of Chinese currency use, which made them easy to be included in STR, which is not the case for So IMF, no alternative. We have to work very hard for that. World Bank, we created BRICS Bank, which is called New Development Bank. Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, but still not substitutes to World Bank or ADB. They are working with them. It's a good thing that additional resources are generated. So development bank, development finance reform, all these things will happen. There are so many things to discuss. What I will tell that uh, the, the, the uh, motivation behind organizing this lecture, which was the Prime Minister's advice, just to talk about what Indian presidency does or what it should be doing. How multilateral system work? As I am saying, he has categorically said that we are negotiators. We are preparing future professors, future um, um, leaders of our country, which are you people. And this is happening across 75 universities. You won't believe the kind of emails we are receiving that why not they, why not we? They are equally jealous that why we are not in the list of 75 and frustrated. Many good universities are not in the 75, the list of 75. So we are helping them to do also. So I'll, uh, with uh, permission from uh, VC, sir, if you are thinking of doing any more activity, if we may not support you each time financially, but as a knowledge partner, as a collaborator, RIS will always be with you, whatever events you are doing on G20 or related affairs. With this, I close. And we have this G20 digest, uh, uh, the four-page document that you have got. The, uh, the actual document is 30 pages. So there is a QR code. If you scan that, the full uh, volume will come, full uh, report will come, 30 pages, 25 pages. And then along with that, there is a link to the past declarations. The leader summit declarations, Sherpa track declarations, 
whatever was available in the public domain, we have put it together. G20 Digest is a scholarly journal. If you want to write a publication to some before submitting your thesis, it follows the same procedure other journals. Peer review would happen. You'll be intimated to re revise the paper. Uh, so, uh, so, so that is also a platform which you connect to, uh, to G20 issues. So please have a look at all these things and let us know if you are thinking of any further activity on G20. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Dr. Dash, for your interesting reflections. Uh, now we'll have a press distribution and followed by Q&A. So we, uh, for this auspicious momentous G20 presidency, we organized four events altogether, four competitions. They were poster painting competition, essay, then allocation and equation competition. So first we'll announce the poster making competition. And we have three winners for this. The third place goes to Mr. Kaushik Chari and Ms. Sonia Kasar from Goa Business School. Yeah, come quickly, please. The second place, yeah. I request Honorable Vice Chancellor to hand over the prizes. The second place goes to Ms. Nandita Das and Mr. Ankur Saini from Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences. And the first place goes to Ms. Sumeda Ghadi and Mr. Sudin Menon from School of Chemical Sciences. Later, we have petition. Now I request Thank you, sir. Now I request Professor Arvind Kumar to give away the prizes for SA competition. The third place goes to Mr. Moses Moses, <laughs> MSA Botany, School of Biological Sciences and Biotechnology. The second place goes to Mr. Mohammad Anas Munaf from MBA two thirds. Okay, and the third place for this was again for uh, Yogini uh, Malvankar, MA Economics, GBS. Okay, second, we'll move on. The second place for essay competition goes to Mr. Mohammad Anas Munaf, MBA, GBS. Okay. We'll move on. Uh, the first place for essay competition goes to Mrunal Shetkar, MSc Physics, School of Physical and Applied. Okay, Miss Mrunal, sorry. Then we'll move on to the third competition, allocation. The third place for allocation competition goes to Ms. Prince Mishra, Sociology, Didi Kosambi School of Social Sciences, Behavioral Studies. And second place for allocation competition goes to Mr. Moses, MSc Botany.
and the first place for elocution competition goes to Alvina Almeida from SIS. Last segment was quiz. Yeah. Now, I, thank you, sir. Now I request uh, Dr. Dash to kindly hand over the prizes. Third place for the quiz competition was backed by a team of Vishnu Langavat and Mr. Aniket Ahuja from S. The second place was backed by Ms. Arya Bosle and Ms. Divya Pujari, again from SIS. And the first place for the quiz was backed by Mr. Amol Yedekar and Mr. Sanket Sinari from Mathematics School of Physics and Applied Sciences. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah so, yeah, sir is making leave. Okay, so now we'll have a Q&A session. So I request uh, all the participants and the students kindly uh, ask your question. And before you raise your question, please identify yourself, short and brief, and please make sure uh, to identify whom the question is for. Just a minute, just a minute. And requesting all the uh, prize winner, please meet Dr. Almin Joes immediately after this. For your signature, basically, you need to sign signature for your prizes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question goes to Mr. Uh, Dr. Professor uh, uh, Dahish. Uh, as, we, as you discuss very uh, insightful discussion regarding the um, contribution of India, you indicate some unique contribution of India that will bring to the table on the G20 president, as a G20 president uh, leader. Uh, the, the thing is, uh, if we see the last, uh, so far we have uh, seen that uh, over two weeks ago that um, uh, foreign minister of G20 meeting in New Delhi um, just ended without a, 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 a agreed, co uh, you know, uh, concluded uh, agreement of or, or concluded statements over the division of uh, uh, over a division of Ukraine uh, uh, crisis. So uh, again, we have seen that geopolitical tension impacted the, this even the foreign minister, and the, or the impact as we see that there is no con agreed concluded statement. So uh, con considering this fact, uh, India presidency, uh, India leading the G20 in a very crisis and a, a very challenging time. We have Taliban in, in, the, in the neighborhood of, of India. Again, the security challenge is there. So uh, my question is, regarding the India presidency in G20, comparing to other uh, major economy like the United States and China, how India will um, manage and chal uh, plan to ch manage this kind of uh, diversity and disagreement between other uh, members of G20? And the second, uh, what will be the unique contribution of India to, this, um, uh, to, uh, to mitigate this um, geopolitical tension in the G20s? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Yusuf, for this question, or the two questions. Uh, Okay. okay, we'll take a club of three questions all together and then we can answer, yeah. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Siar Yusuf. I'm from SIS. 
So my question goes to Professor Avin Kumar. So, sir, do you think that India's presence, uh, presidency of G20 would have implications for all economic, economic crisis uh, head countries uh, of India's subcontinent? Like, for instance, Sri Lanka, uh, Pakistan, or uh, Bangladesh, which have taken a five billion loan from IF recently. So, if you would answer that, thank you. Yeah, over here, yeah, yeah. Moses. Moses. Thank you so much. My question goes to Dr. Dash. You talked about the rotating chair of the G20 presidency, where you said that uh, the next countries are going to be others, and we don't know what their agendas are going to be. So my question is, where is India's agenda going to go after here? Because I'm worried it might be a very good agenda, but the presidency is just one year. So what happens next? Okay, and any other? Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you, Yusuf, for those two questions. <clears throat> On the first one, cast your mind back to last year in Samarkand. The Prime Minister meets with President Putin, and in the full glare of the media, very politely, but as a good friend, tells him, Mr. President, this is not the era of war. Fine, that's an Indian statement. Within a matter of days, it gets picked up by President Macron who was speaking in the UNGA, and he says what my friend Prime Minister Modi said should not be limited just to India saying it. This is essentially what we believe, the world believes, that very formulation. Move further. When the actual joint communique was issued in Bali, there were a lot of issues. But this particular statement of Prime Minister Modi got officially formulated and encapsulated within the joint communique. So what India argued, which is a very balanced and a very nuanced principle stand, and what is the meaning of this is not the era of war? The whole idea of this is not the era of war means we should not think in terms of old mindsets, which are essentially empirist, which are essentially expansionist, which are hegemonic. Let's identify the challenges of today. You, you come from Afghanistan, of course the Taliban is a big challenge. But while nobody is undermining that challenge, the very understanding of security today has expanded. Dr. Dash spoke to some of it. The canvas of what constitutes security today is much, much, much larger and different to how it is understood before. Geopolitics has an impact, but geopolitics also creates geoeconomic security initiatives. And if you look at Ukraine, Russia, while the battle is being played out in Eurasia, the impact is being felt globally because food prices, energy prices, shipping lanes, supply chain resilience, all are impacted. And what I was saying there and what makes India's presidency unique, every presidency before this was a context presidency. There was a certain context and in that context a theme was drawn up and a theme was spoken to. If you look at Indonesia, they were very, very clear about it. All that they wanted, bring back tourism. Because Indonesia sees itself as a country that needs tourism. So effectively, the entire agenda was limited to tourism and to issues around tourism. That's why build back better, build back stronger. India's presidency and this, and I, and I agree, in one year, no problems are going to be solved. Maybe not even for a decade. But where India's presidency is unique is, it's not just a context presidency, it's a futuristic opportunity presidency. The five dimensions that India has laid out, from climate finance and green funding all the way down to women-led development is not something which is of the past. It is looking forward to the next 10, 20, 20, you know, 30 years. It is Prime Minister Modi who has laid down a very important term. Everyone talks of energy security and stops at that. He said, why should we not be ambitious enough to go much beyond energy security and to be able to work for energy independence? <clears throat> and I'm drawing on what Professor Arvind Kumar talked about that if you're looking at what makes a developed country or a, you know, a country that is on the rise, it is per capita energy consumption. But along with per capita energy consumption and its trajectory rise, you have to be able to see efficiency in energy consumption. And the moment you diversify your energy mix, and the moment you then bring efficiency in your energy mix, you are not just ensuring energy security, you are moving to the highest level of energy security, which is energy independence. And this is not what we're looking just for India. We are saying energy independence of the global south. 
and that is why ISA is part of it, that is why green hydrogen is part of it, that is why the blue economy is part of it, and we want to bring in every coordinate of the world into this. So I would say India has a context presidency, but India also has an opportunity presidency to look forward to. And that is what makes India's leadership quite unique going forward. Thank you. Yeah, so there, there may not be any agreed text coming from the deliberations which happened uh, among the Minister of Finance Minister's meeting. But one thing was very clear, that in the changing dynamics of geopolitics, how India can play a better and important role. So that was very much clearly uh, assigned and uh, accepted by the other members of the G20 also. The question with regard to the other countries in South Asia, as you know that India is the only country in South Asia which is the member of G20. But at the same time, if you take that uh, finance minister uh, track meeting, which happened just before the foreign minister track, you will see that how India was arguing largely for helping these countries in terms of saying that, look, now the time has come where there could be again the lending rates and all, which again they do, how the interest which they again they charge, how that could, could be lessened for, a, in fact, uh, a stable growth of their economy. So I think India still has been uh, highly vocal in terms of finding certain mechanism by which these countries uh, can get benefit. And obviously there could be some sort of a framework which could be created in the foreseeable future where you see that how the other uh, challenges which these countries are confronting, especially from the, the debt trap, diplomacy which China is uh, an expert in, and how that could really be addressed uh, in the foreseeable future. I think India has, has been attempting slowly and steadily, I think we'll be able to build a consensus among the members of this uh, G20. As was pointed out, the G20 uh, constitutes 80% of the GDP of the global economy. So I think the onus lies on these countries because they obviously have to find ways and mechanism for the other 20% uh, percent, uh, uh, of the GDP and because their, their, their growth has to increase. And that is, how, that is how India has been arguing for a stable growth and how much they could really also balance uh, all these, uh, uh, this economic uh, uh, risk. All these things can really be addressed. Thank you. I think I'll begin with the question uh, that was directly um, addressed to me. You know, since G20 uh, agenda is not a complete disruption every presidency, there is some continuity is maintained. What happens, uh, there is a transition team which works uh, when the next presidency comes. Uh, which we hear from, since we work in the ministry, we uh, get to know because these are not in public domain. Uh, a week back, we were meeting the chief coordinator of uh, India in the G20 Secretariat and discussing this University Connect program. Basically, I was briefing them. So there they said, you know, we have already got the request from Brazil for this transition team to visit India to understand how do you do the presidency, what type of agenda you have. So some sort of learning happens from the past presidencies that these were the, the priorities of those times. And each presidency wants to add something on its own because you want to have a footprint. Can we refer later on based on their homegrown experience? Brazil and South Africa is expected to by and large follow India's position on most of the issues because it's just a coincidence which works well. These are BRICS countries also. These are IFSA countries also. India, Brazil, South Africa is IFSA. Brazil, uh, Russia, uh, Brazil, uh, India, and China are member, uh, important members of BRICS. So these economies are uh, sort of speak in the same language. Of course, the agenda is very different, which I haven't taken that they are all competitors among themselves. India is competing with Brazil. Brazil is competing with South Africa. South Africa is competing with India. But they also talk in the common platform BRICS. So the competing powers which speak from the global south perhaps will converge to an agenda that which, which is development oriented. And this transition team basically learns. So hopefully some of these common areas will, will be there in Brazil and South Africa. This is at G2G level. Some sort of capacity building also happens at the intellectual level, think tank level. Like they know RIS is working on G20. 
we have already got so much so much of correspondence already started for brazil and south africa a year back let us do joint events let us understand how it happens because we involved japanese presidency when we were learning from them at think tank level we engaged the south saudi arabian think tank which was doing so a lot of capacity also happens at a civil society level trade union level industry association level so some convergence of issues would happen it's not a complete disruption but of course one year is a very short time to expect a lot what is required that a gradual process of recognizing something that could pave the way for a bigger achievement outcome sometime later on how many of you uh, i mean you might have seen seen the leader declaration please go and see the leader declaration anyone whichever of your fancy italy japan germany saudi arabia any leader declaration you see read the language we recognize we endorse we agree because beyond that they can't do anything so does it mean all nonsense no un resolution condemning attack on ukraine was it a document which is just lying somewhere in the un library no this could become reference documents g20 any discussion happens at the multilateral level could be referred at any point of time as a reference document that at some point of time some discussion happened on that so let us be hopeful that something would happen i would also like to address uh, the uh, the query from uh, our afghanistan friend there you know uh, foreign ministers meeting not coming up with the communique is not a first time happening in the uh, history wto most of the general assembly the specific chairs are there market access chair trade in goods trade in services trade facilitation committee most of the time they don't agree it is the chair summary which comes but wto has not stopped functioning it's still functioning diplomacy is a process diplomacy can't deliver in a year in a six months like that the taliban story that you are talking about do you know what india invested in afghanistan we were citing india's development development cooperation projects uh, loudly and proudly that we have constructed schools hospital bridges dams in afghanistan and why why would you not take pride for that and what happened so there are many such misadventures which is beyond anticipation it would take time to do it but multilateral processes are quite complicated diplomacy requires lot of back channel work it's a process which can deliver at at a very long time but it's more more of sort of agreeing to reach sit together and discuss who was the country who made the joint leader declaration of indonesia to happen it was india indonesian presidency without would have ended without leader declaration forget about foreign minister it is indian's prime minister which spoke to them sort of accommodated everybody's version and then the declaration was issued you know the fa the most tangible failure of a presidency is not coming up with the leader declaration foreign minister says okay it's fine so uh, so uh, just to add what dr dates was saying uh, so 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 that is that is how it happens so india um, if france says that people here india says uh, people think twice but now there is a greater recognition that these are the countries who should be given more space to talk these are the countries who should be given more space to contribute to the economic policy the global regulatory systems all these thank you just i will take 30 second uh, to really uh, answer that part which is very important and if you take a case study of any type which india has put as a part of uh, discussion points in the g20 and take climate finance for that matter and see that varying perspective which comes from uh, developing countries and developed countries because developed countries really will have to be assuming responsibility in terms of aiding to the developing world to address to the mitigation of strategy and, and, and adaptation. So I think you will have difficulties in terms of building consensus on many of the areas. But yes, on sustainable development, again, the developed world, their consumption pattern is different. And they again would not be willing to again uh, share that responsibility to help the developing world. So every agenda, when you take and discuss in detail, how best there could be a common agreed framework that will remain a part of challenge. But at the same time, the G20 meetings and deliberations, suppose the next uh, president is going to be Brazil, 
and after that it is going to be South Africa. So as was rightly pointed out that there will be at least continuity in terms of these approaches which again they will discuss in a manner by which sooner or later they have to build a consensus. Thank you. I just forgot to that neighborhood policy thing. You know, who, which are those countries which did well in MDG, multi uh, millennium development goals, which were supposed to be achieved by 2015? Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. What happened in those uh, Sri Lanka? Who did this? Is the ordinary people spoiled their own economies? Is the vision of some leaders, is the process, somewhere organic farming is good. But can you kill all the people just because you want organic farming? You also need that lot of grain is there, a lot of maize is there in the market. Then you go for that. So, so certain things are beyond you know, the reach of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, um, uh, policy makers also. All right. So we'll just go for two more questions if anybody has. Yeah, there. Yeah. Please introduce yourself and to the question. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Kifile. I'm from SAIS. My question is towards uh, that is there. Um, in line with the G20's debt uh, service suspension initiative, as well as the common framework that followed after that, uh, considering Africa's um, pre-pandemic sovereign debt um, problem, as well as uh, economic fragility during the pandemic, um, what is the remedy of debt sustainability in the continent despite uh, debt suspension, which didn't yield much food then because only a few countries qualified? And uh, under one question, one question. Yeah, Keep it short. Keep it short, please. Yeah. Okay. I will end it there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, you can't, there's somebody behind there. What? I, I, I request those, no, no, I, I, uh, those, I request those who have a question for Datesh, you can go back tomorrow and ask him that. It's not that you need to ask him here. But, but if there is specific questions that you wish to know from Professor Arvind Kumar or Dr. Das about the G20, I think that would be better. Because all of you are students of Datesh, so it's not necessarily you have to ask him here. And we can, in fact, discuss it over the cup of tea. Yes, as well yes, yes, later. because a lot of students uh, take the buses back home, no? so the they miss the buses. That is the reason. Uh, thank you, sir. I am Aniketa Hujar from SIS. My question is, along with G20, India is also uh, chairing the SCEO this year. So, do you think that both these presidencies will complement each other in raising India's stature in the international arena when it comes to macroeconomic and security issues, or will they have their individual benefits and implications? Thank you. Uh, good evening, speakers and everyone. I'm Jonas and Rodriguez. I am from the political science program of Didi Kosambi School of Social Sciences and Behavioral Studies. My question is to Professor Erwin Kumar. You have mentioned in your address about reducing dependency on fossil fuels. Now, another initiative taken by India is the EV policy, you could say, the use of electronic vehicles. Should we also be concerned about increasing use of EVs as to, you, to manufacture EVs or EV battery components, you utilize lithium. Now, lithium extraction causes air and soil contamination in various places. Also, there are very limited places with such res reserves. So should we also be considering balancing with fossil fuels as well as looking for alternative arrangements to lithium as G20 organizers? All right, I think it's a very good question you have raised. But you'll be glad to know that now India has found a very huge uh, lithium reserve in uh, Kashmir. It has happened only three weeks ago. And obviously, is, uh, the extraction and uh, various other aspects will show that in India will have a good amount of lithium under its own control. Because India still is dependent on uh, the other countries for lithium import. That is one. Second thing is, uh, see, the problem of the world. What is the problem of the world? Problem of the world is that the emission of carbon and more and more concentration of greenhouse gas will obviously have more and more problems for climate change. So in that context, India has been attempting to find ways and mechanisms to mobilize international public opinion by which they could reduce the dependency on the use of the fossil fuel. 
India has shown the result, as I said, that the stipulations which were made in Paris Protocol, India was supposed to, uh, to lessen the use of the fossil fuel by 2030, less than 60 percent. India has done uh, by December 2022. So I think that part is going on. But at the same time, how best India could be bringing that at the level of zero dependency on the fossil fuel? It will take its own course. EV, in a, in, in a certain form, ha has been found as a suitable answer to that. But at the same time, it is not foolproof. The research still has been undergoing. And that research obviously is on whether that also is going to be adding uh, more challenges in terms of carbon emission. So I think a lot of these aspects again will uh, be addressed in the foreseeable future. There is no denying the fact on that. With regard to that questions on the SCO and the, this uh, G20 presidency, see this is something which has happened on rotation. So it's not that it has happened uh, because of any other factor. But at the same time, the expectations of the rest of the world from India is that India perhaps would be able to find answer to the many of this global problem. And that is something which uh, our trust in India has been reposed in. So responsibility on part of India has been increasing. SEO, as you know, SEO was nothing but a culmination of Shanghai plus five. And the SEO came into existence in 2001. It has a long drawn process. India was given the membership only a couple of years ago. Pakistan also was given the membership. So a lot of these internal, internal contradictions because of the changing dynamics of geopolitics in Central Asia is obviously warranting a special attention from India among the members of SEO. Because most of these oil and gas which Central Asia has is already been uh, under the influence of China. So I think most of the resources which the Central Asian have, I don't think that India is uh, going to have any additional benefit from those resources. The point is that how best India can be bringing certain other major issues to keep these nations in, in, a, in a way by which they could again ad address the larger global problem. So assume and mandate itself is changing. They wanted to limit uh, Russia's role in the beginning. Now China-Russia cooperation has been increasing and that cooperation obviously will have a different dimension because of again the perception which the rest of the world has on the ongoing uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict. And that has given that geopolitical space for uh, Russia to become more closer to China. So I think a lot of these challenges will again be seen happening in SEO and obviously India is going to bring it, uh, it on the table. Very diplomatically India will have to address many of these uh, concerns which both G20 and SCO will have. The challenges will be far too many, but obviously the presidency will give a, some sort of an opportunity for India to understand each other's perception. And that perception obviously is going to be, uh, I think, of greater relevance for India, assuming the responsibility to lead the regional as well as global affairs. I'll also like to take this question, India and SCO. We often make fun because SEO is the unfortunate uh, chairship in 2023 because of G20, nobody is bothering SEO. But SEO, SEO's priority is just very good. It's, it's called secure. Each world has an expansion. You, you can check that. I'm forgetting some of these. But you know, the, uh, we can't leverage both at the same time. Like Sark, Beamstek, these are all called low-profile low organizations. Beamstek, we have raised a little bit in the last few years because uh, from RISI, I keep participating in MEA meetings and others. So, but SARC is a low profile. SEO is a confused organization. As he was referring to, everybody is there. Nobody knows what, what this organization is. It is a security driven architecture. But its agenda is not given. Those who are working on Central Asia, they are only extend, they have extended their work on SEO. I did some work in Central Asia, so ICWA is the as a SEO study center. उन्होंने मुझे लिखा कि भाई हमारा हर महीने एक-एक scholar आएंगे SEO country से आप उनको एक-एक faculty interaction meeting कर दीजिए। I am doing that. Nobody is interested to attend that meeting. Nobody is writing. एक मेरा friend है VIF में विवेकानंद International Foundation. He is only writing on SEO presidency. No literature, no expectation from SEO. And you won't believe I won't name the ministry कि बोल वो नहीं इंस्ट्रक्ट कर रहे हैं आपने ऑफिशियल को इसको क्वाइट वे में कर दो एसीओ का कुछ जो मीटिंग मीटिंग है कर दो सो इट्स नॉट इट्स अनफॉर्च्यूनेट टाइम फॉर एसीओ पर हाफ इट विल टेक सम टाइम टू अंडरस्टैंड पाकिस्तान इंडिया रूसिया चाइना एवरीबॉडी इज देयर तो व्हाट वुड बी फ्यूचर इट्स बी सीन बट इफ यू सी द वेबसाइट ऑफ एसीओ बहुत बढ़िया ये है बहुत बढ़िया स्कीम है बट अनफॉर्च्यूनेटली इट नोबडी इज फॉलोइंग दैट इट विल टेक टाइम टू Your questions would have been that why India has not taken a, a special lecture for SEO. Uh, 
उसने क्या किए हैं रेसिडेंट रिसर्च और प्रोग्राम किए हैं सेवन एशियो कंट्रीज से एवरी मंथ वन रिसर्च स्कॉलर इज कमिंग टू इंडिया आई सी डब्ल्यू इज कोडिनेटिंग तो पूरा देश में वो एक महीने घूमेंगे इंटरेक्शन करेंगे वो कर रहे हैं ओके नाउ आई रिक्वेस्ट एस आई एस स्टूडेंट्स एंड ए प्राइज विनर पार्टिसिपेंट प्लीज असेंबल ऑन द स्टेज फॉर क्विक फोटोग्राफ ऑल दी प्राइज विनर एज वेल quickly please prize winner will will take a pic pic uh, uh, after this okay just hold on yeah first we'll take it with ss come on first All the prize winners please assemble quickly on the stage